I know we've talked in the past about reinsurance not really being as attractive an industry in, say, the next 10 years as the last 10. But I don't think we've talked specifically about general re. And I look this morning at the 10Q and I see general re has grown nicely. I know there's been some changes in the, in the management. And I wondered if you could just give us a sense of what's going on at the company to bring about some of that growth and, and what looks like improvement. Yeah, well, the reinsurance business, I don't, I don't think I'd say that it's tougher than it was 10 years ago, but it, if you go back to 40 or 50 years ago, uh, it, was, it was not brutally competitive, I'll put it that way. Uh, um, and the generally, uh, uh, Tad Montrose, who did a fantastic job for us at Genry, retired, and, and uh, we have uh, under a Jeet, and then Kara in addition, but under a Jeet, uh, the focus of the place has changed somewhat, and it probably, it probably is more growth-oriented uh, than before, but I can assure you that anything associated with Ajit is also has underwriting discipline attached to it, but I, uh, there has, as you've correctly noticed, there's been some pickup, and uh, uh, I think I think actually we'll see the property casualty reinsurance business grow a fair amount, and the life business reinsurance business, and this is really the only place we do much in life. But that has grown very substantially ever since we took it over, uh, particularly and in, particularly internationally. And so that that part I like, and, and uh, uh, we will have a somewhat I think we'll have a somewhat larger operation at Gen Re. But we have we have various methods, as you know, of being in reinsurance. We do these huge bulk deals. That's why our net revenues are down this year. We did that ten billion dollar deal with AIG, which was the biggest deal in history uh, last year, and we don't have a repeat of it this year. We will be in the reinsurance business five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and 50 years from now, in my view, and we will have some unusual advantages that stem both from our capital position, our attitude toward the business, and the talent that we have. I, we have, we have an, a way better than average insurance business generally. We have some real gems that nobody really knows much about, and we have a very, very good reinsurance business that will be subject to more ups and downs than something like GEICO will be, which just moves ahead every year. Um, but it, it will be an important part of Berkshire. Charlie? Yeah, I, I would argue the part that any idiot financier can easily get into has gotten way tougher. And, and why wouldn't it? Charlie is my substitute for my father-in-law that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, station 11. Hey, Warren, Charlie. Thank you again for having us and, and having me. Uh, I just can't thank you guys enough and appreciate you guys enough for the body of work that you guys have delivered to us and the uh, exemplar example that you guys have set with your principles. Thank you. Charlie, you mentioned that... Charlie, you've mentioned that if given the chance, or the same chance with a smaller capital base, you would still look for mispriced stock opportunities. Of uh, course. <laughs> uh, and that would be determined through, obviously, what, what we call the, uh, the intrinsic value of the organization, or the, the company in question, an aggregate of the discounted future cash flows. Would you work the arithmetic using a fictional data set to illustrate the mathematical principia uh, to determine an intrinsic value? Um, and I'd hope you include the comprehensive metal, uh, mental model of the key metrics considered, any quali uh, qualitative assessments of the management, and any assumptions of its industry to determine the durability of its earning power. Uh, and Warren, uh, same, same to that effect, would you also demonstrate or illustrate a uh, an arithmetic uh, problem set using with a significant capital base and provide the object lessons on how those have changed from a small to a large capital base? Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach 
because I don't use one. And I just mix all, I just mix all the factors and, and if the gap between value and, and price is not attractive, I go on to something else. And sometimes it's just quantitative. For instance, when Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate, I like the competitive position, I liked the, the way the personnel system worked, I, I liked everything about it and I thought even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll, they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. This is the longest we've ever gone in the Berkshire meeting without Charlie saying that, getting to the point where he prefers Costco to Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs>